In our last lecture, I introduced our study of the historical Jesus by talking about our approach to the task. We'll be laying aside our personal beliefs or disbeliefs about Jesus in order to examine all of our surviving sources to see what he actually said and did. In this lecture, we can leap right into the task. But it's difficult to know where to start. We could start with the first gospel of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew. It does, after all, begin the New Testament with a life of Jesus, and so it's a sensible place to start, a place where many professors who teach classes in the New Testament begin their classes. But even though the book of Matthew is the first book in the New Testament, it was not the first written. The first books to be written in the New Testament were produced by the Apostle Paul, to whom are ascribed 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. These books, these 13 books of Paul, are letters that Paul wrote to different individuals and communities uh, in churches that he himself had established. He wrote these letters 10 or 15 years prior to the Gospels of the New Testament. So it may, may, might make sense to begin our study of uh, Jesus with the earliest New Testament books, those written by Paul. Unfortunately, as we'll see later in the course, Paul does not record a good deal of information about the words and deeds of Jesus. His letters are concerned about other things, principally about problems that had arisen in his own communities that he was trying to address. And in the course of addressing these issues in his communities, Paul simply didn't take the occasion to talk about what Jesus said and did. And so Paul doesn't seem like the best place to start either. Maybe then we should begin with the earliest gospel to be written, which most scholars agree was the gospel of Mark. There's some controversy among scholars still about which of the Gospels was first. Some scholars think that the Gospel of Matthew was written prior to Mark, but that's a minority uh, opinion. Since the mid-19th century, the vast majority of scholars have thought that Mark was the first to be written and that Matthew and Luke represent a kind of expansion of Mark. Mark uh, was writing probably in 65 or 70 A.D., uh, several centuries, several, I'm sorry, several decades after Jesus himself lived. Jesus himself probably died sometime around the year 30. Is it best then to begin with a book written 30, 35, 40 years after the facts? Where should we begin a study of the historical Jesus? I've decided that the best place to begin our study is by summarizing for you the life of a remarkable man who lived nearly 2,000 years ago. The accounts of his life may sound familiar to you. Even before he was born, his mother knew that he would not be a normal child. In fact, she had an angelic visitor come to her prior to her conception, explaining that uh, the one who would be born of her would himself be divine. His birth itself was accompanied by miraculous signs and wonders. As a young child, he was religiously precocious, beyond what the adult religious leaders that he met could have imagined possible. As an adult, he left home to engage in an itinerant preaching ministry, going from village to town, teaching his good news that people did not need to be tied to the material things of this world, but should live for what is spiritual. He gathered a number of disciples around him who became convinced that he was no mere mortal, and he did miracles to confirm them in their faith, healing the sick, casting out demons, and even raising the dead. But he raised the ire of many of those in power who brought him up on charges before the Roman authorities. Even after he left this world, though, his followers continued to believe in him, claiming that he had ascended to heaven and that they had seen him alive afterwards. At a later time, some of his followers wrote books about his life, 
and some of these writings still survive today. But I doubt if any of you has ever read any of them. And I doubt if many of you have even heard the name of the man I've been describing. Apollonius of Tiana. Apollonius of Tiana, the famous Neo-Pythagorean philosopher of the first century A.D. Apollonius, a worshiper of the pagan gods, whose life and teachings are recorded for us in the writings of his later follower, Philostratus, in a book called The Life of Apollonius of Tiana. Apollonius lived at about the same time as Jesus, although they never knew each other. Their followers, though, knew each other, and they entered into heated debates concerning who was the superior being. Apollonius' followers claimed that he was a miracle-working son of God, born supernaturally, supernaturally endowed, endowed to do miracles, who delivered supernatural teachings, and at the end of his life ascended to heaven. Jesus, according to the followers of Apollonius, was a magician and a fraud. Jesus' followers, of course, argued just the opposite. Jesus was the miracle-working Son of God. Apollonius was the fraud. What is striking and what is little known is that these were not the only two men in the ancient world who were believed to be divine. There were lots of people who were thought to have been miraculously born, empowered from on high to do miracles, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to deliver spectacular life-transforming teachings, who were thought to have ascended to heaven at the end of their lives, where they still live today. Jesus may be the only miracle-working Son of God that we know about in our world, but he was not at all the only one talked about in his own world. This, though, raises a number of disturbing questions. If Jesus was described by his followers in ways that sounded a lot like the ways other divine men, as we might call them, were being described, how do we know that his followers didn't make it all up? that they didn't simply make Jesus look better as they told stories about him, so that he would seem to be superior to Apollonius and all the others. Is it possible that the early Christians who described Jesus and then wrote the Gospels about him made him look like other divine men, but that he himself actually wasn't that way? I would assume, by the way, that most people in our world would would think that the followers of Apollonius made him look more supernatural than he really was and made up these stories about him. Most people don't think Apollonius really was born miraculously and really could raise the dead and really did ascend to heaven. Most people would assume that about Apollonius. What about Jesus? Is it possible that Jesus' followers made up these stories about him to make him appear to be a divine man? Well, it's an important question. It's the one I want to begin our study with. At this stage, my point is that to begin a study of Jesus requires us to begin with some sense of the context within which the early Christians told their stories about him, because these are the stories that have come down to us today that are uh, found in our surviving sources. As we'll see more fully later in this course, the Gospel writers themselves appear to have inherited their stories about Jesus from a rich oral tradition about him. That is, that they heard stories about Jesus that had been in circulation after his death. Uh, and so it'll be important for us to think about this oral tradition for a while. First, I need to give you some basic background information about our earliest sources of Jesus which, as I've indicated before, are the Gospels of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We call them Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because these are their traditional names based on their traditional authors. Uh, but in fact, uh, the books themselves are anonymous. 
meaning that the authors did not attach their own names to these books. Scholars are fairly unanimous that these books were written some decades after Jesus' death. Mark is usually thought to have been written sometime uh, around 65 to 70 A.D. Matthew and Luke, some 15, 20 years later, 80 to 85 A.D. The Gospel of John is usually thought to have been the last Gospel written, 90 to 95 A.D. These books, as with all of the books of the New Testament, were written in Greek. Greek was a kind of lingua franca of the Roman Empire, spoken throughout the empire, much as English is spoken throughout much of uh, Europe today. Greek was spoken among the educated elite in the Roman Empire. The books, then, are written in Greek. Even though Jesus himself, as a Palestinian Jew, would have spoken Aramaic, After Jesus' death, people told stories about him. Since most Christians, even in the first century, were probably non-Jews, that is, they converted from being pagans. Uh, in this context, by the way, the, the word pagan uh, is a non-derogatory term. Uh, it's used by historians simply to refer to anybody in antiquity who is neither a Jew nor a Christian. Most Christians in the first century had converted not from Judaism, but from being pagans. These are the people who were telling the stories about Jesus after he died for several decades before the gospel writers wrote their stories about him. It might be worth our while, then, to learn something about typical pagan beliefs about religion if we want to understand how the stories about Jesus might have been modified by the Christians who told them. Pagan religions seem very strange to people living in our own world. These were religions that were focused on practices of sacrifice to the gods in order to placate them. Uh, pagan religions involve sacrifices of animals and of, uh, of um, vegetable products, uh, food products, in order to please the gods. These religions did not, by and large, have doctrines that had to be believed by their adherents. These were not religions based on faith or beliefs. They were religions based on sacrifices to the gods. Now, you probably had to believe that there were gods and they wanted these sacrifices, but there were no creeds, no doctrines that had to be believed by, uh, by people involved in pagan religions. Oddly enough, these religions did not have ethics as a major component. Uh, people in the ancient world did think you should be ethical, but ethics were, not a matter, ethics were not a matter of religion. They were more a matter of philosophy and personal lifestyle. There were, there were very few uh, religious requirements for ethical, what we would think of as ethical behavior. These are religions, unlike most of the ones that uh, people in our context are familiar with, that did not have sacred books. They were not scriptural types of religion. Oddly enough, most of these religions did not emphasize anything like exclusive commitments. In other words, if you participated in one religion, sacrificing to one god in a particular way, that didn't prevent you from worshiping another god at another time and in another place. In fact, people worshiped lots of gods and could worship them in any way that, uh, that seemed appropriate and traditional. There were not a, a religious exclusive commitments. Probably the most strange thing about ancient pagan religions, though, for people in our context, is precisely the very core of these religions, namely that they were devoted to multiple gods. These religions were extremely diversified to the extent that most scholars uh, doubt whether you can even l label something called paganism in the ancient world and have it mean very much. They were extremely diversified as religions, but these religions were all unified to the extent that they were all polytheistic. Pagans believed in a multitude of gods of all kinds. The great gods of Greek and Roman mythology, local gods of the city or town, gods of uh, various functions, gods who oversaw crops, health, childbirth, 
uh, gods of specific locations, gods of the fields, of the rivers, places within the home. There were gods for the hearth, for the pantry, for the threshold. As I've already intimated, pagans for the most, most part did not see their gods as jealous beings, as being in competition with one another. This is why there weren't exclusive commitments to one god or the other. Gods didn't mind which other gods you worshipped so long as you gave uh, each god its own due. Most pagans appear to have understood the realm of the gods as a kind of pyramid of power and authority. So you can conceptualize the divine realm in pagan religions as a kind of pyramid. At the very top of this pyramid, for many pagans, there was some kind of supreme deity, one ultimate god. Uh, this doesn't, I don't mean to say that pagans were monotheists, believing only one, but most thought that there, at least most who wrote us our literary remains, in other words, the educated elite, believed that there was some kind of ultimate deity at the very top of all things. Below this super, supreme god, whether it's Zeus or Jupiter or some unnamed god, there were the great gods, for example, the gods of Mount Olympus that we know about from Greek and Roman myth. The ancients, by the way, didn't literally subscribe to the myths as being uh, true events from the past, the way that people today might believe in the stories of the uh, Hebrew Scripture or the New Testament. Uh, the myths told interesting stories about the gods, but even most ancients realized that these weren't literally true stories about them. But the gods that the stories are about did exist, the great gods uh, of Greek and Roman mythology. Below these great gods, there were other kinds of local deities, who were still unbelievably powerful from the human perspective, but were not as powerful as the great gods. Below these uh, different kinds of local deities, there were family and personal deities. Uh, these were uh, very uh, minor gods in terms of the, uh, the entire divine realm, but quite important to individuals uh, who were more actively involved with individual lives. Below these kinds of gods was an even lesser group of divinities that was often called, uh, this group is often called the daimonia. This is the word we get our word demons from, uh, but they weren't necessarily uh, evil spirits that would inhabit bodies uh, uh, to force them to do all sorts of nefarious things. Daimonia were not necessarily evil uh, spirits. They were just lower level divinities that were involved uh, more closely with human life. Below these daimonia, there was another tier on this divine pyramid that comprised a group of demigods, that is to say, humans, who were half mortal and half divine. Included in this group were people of fantastic power, physical strength, like Hercules in the Roman tradition, called Heracles in the Greek tradition, or individuals of superhuman wisdom, like the philosopher Pythagoras, or of mind-boggling eminence, like the Roman emperor. Within the Roman Empire, people did understand that the Roman em emperor himself was, in some sense, divine. This did not mean that he was the ultimate god. I mean, he, in terms of as far as the divine realm goes, he was, he was extremely low on the totem pole. But uh, as far as from a human perspective, he was unbelievably powerful and strong, and he was, in fact, partly divine. On this lowest tier of the divine realm would be other miracle-working representatives of God, some of them thought of as half-divine, like Apollonius of Tiana, and presumably for many pagans, Jesus. I don't have time in this lecture to go into all of the intricacies of the pagan religions, but I do at least want us to pause for a moment on this much information that we've already considered. If there was a general and widespread understanding that there were humans on earth who were themselves partially divine, and if this understanding was shared by people who later became Christians. Is it possible that these people began to understand Jesus himself this way 
after they converted, and that they told stories about him to make him look more like this kind of divine man. Now, in the next lecture, I'll be considering this particular question further. At this point, though, I simply want to stimulate our thinking by noting a couple of interesting data that come from our surviving Gospels that may be relevant to the point. I've already indicated that the first Gospel to be written that we have is the Gospel of Mark. We'll see in a later lecture that there are compelling reasons for thinking that Mark was used by the author of the Gospel of Luke as one of his own sources for writing his account some 10 or 15 years later. And so it might be a useful exercise to compare how Jesus is portrayed in our earliest Gospel of Mark with how he's portrayed in a later Gospel that used Mark as a source, the Gospel of Luke. For the purpose of our brief comparison here, I'd like to point out how these Gospels begin and end. Mark's Gospel is the shortest, not only the earliest, but also the shortest of our Gospels. This Gospel begins with an account of Jesus as an adult being baptized by John the Baptist. The account begins, The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Well, Mark identifies then uh, his uh, subject as being Jesus, who's thought to be the Christ, which is uh, the same word as Messiah, the Son of God. What does it mean, though, to say that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, it's interesting that Mark proceeds to quote in the next verse, chapter 1, verse 2, a, a prophet from the Hebrew Bible, the prophet Isaiah. See, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Mark immediately launches into a, a, a quotation of the Hebrew Bible. And then there appears a prophet-like figure, John the Baptist, who's described in terms reminiscent of a Hebrew prophet, Elijah, from the Hebrew Bible, who engages in a Jewish act of baptism for the remission of sins. My point is, Mark calls Jesus the Son of God and then starts uh, appealing to the Jewish scriptures and describing a Jewish prophet before Jesus uh, undergoing the Jewish rite of baptism. When he's baptized... Uh, by John the Baptist, a voice comes from heaven which tells Jesus, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. Jesus, in this Gospel, begins as an adult and he's baptized by John the Baptist. He's called the Son of God. Since the Gospel goes out of its way to establish its concern with the Jewish Scriptures and the Jewish world, what would a Jewish person think the Son of God was? Well, in the Hebrew Bible, a number of people are called the Son of God. Jewish leaders are called the sons of God. The uh, king of Israel is called the Son of God. Uh, even some kings of Israel who were not uh, particularly godly, like uh, King Solomon. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14, Solomon... Uh, is said to be the Son of God. He will be a son to me, and I will be his father, says God. Sometimes the entire nation of Israel is called the Son of God. Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, Out of Egypt have I called my son. In the Hebrew Bible, the Son of God is an individual or a group of individuals who is called by God to do his will, who mediates his will here on earth. The Son of God in the Hebrew Bible is not a divine being. He's a human being who mediates God's will on earth. Mark's Gospel identifies Jesus as the Son of God. He shows up by being baptized as an adult. How does Luke begin his Gospel? The Gospel of Luke, written 10 to 15 years later, does not begin with Jesus being baptized as an adult and being identified as a Jewish son of God. As is well known, Luke begins his Gospel by describing the events surrounding Jesus' birth. Jesus, in Luke's Gospel, is born as the Son of God because Jesus' mother, in this account, 
is a virgin who is impregnated not by a human being, but by God himself. Before her uh, conception, the angel Gabriel comes to her and says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. Why is he the Son of God? He's the Son of God because God is, in fact, his Father. At the end of Luke's account, we have a story that is not found in Mark. In Mark's gospel, at the end, women who have seen Jesus crucified go to his tomb and find the tomb empty, and they encounter a couple of heavenly visitors who tell them to go tell the disciples. I'm sorry, they find one heavenly visitor who tells them to go tell the disciples. Luke's gospel continues that the women actually did tell the disciples. The disciples gather together. They see Jesus after his resurrection. And then at the end, they see Jesus ascend into heaven. Is it an accident that the later account, the gospel of Luke, written after the stories about Jesus had been in circulation for a longer time among former pagans, that this later gospel is the one that portrays Jesus more in line with what pagans typically thought about divine men, that they were born of the union of a divine being and a mortal, and that at the end of their lives they ascended into heaven. Is that an accident? John's gospel was written even later than uh, Luke and Mark. Most scholars don't think that John used Mark or Luke as a source, And like Mark, the Gospel of John does not narrate a virgin birth or an ascension. But the difference in the way Jesus is portrayed between John and Mark is completely striking. As we've seen, in Mark, Jesus clearly is God's favored one, his son, whom God empowers to do miracles and who dies then for the sins of the world. But in Mark's Gospel, Jesus is completely human in every way. He never talks about himself as divine. And no one identifies him as being God, not even the author himself. Contrast that with Jesus' portrayal in John, where Jesus is identified as the word of God himself who is responsible for the creation of the universe, where Jesus is called God both by the author and by others in the gospel, where Jesus himself says that he is equal with God in our latest gospel. Again, is it an accident that the earliest of our gospels portrays Jesus as human and the latest portrays him as divine? It's commonly been noted that, in fact, as time goes on, Christians began to portray Jesus in increasingly exalted terms. In Mark, Jesus is a human who's called God's son, In Luke, he appears to be a kind of divine man whose father is not a mortal, but God himself. In John, Jesus is himself equal with God. But even there, it's not the same as saying that he's identical with God. Being equal with God isn't the same as saying you're identical with God. Later Christians, though, did make this claim. Uh, that Jesus was identical with God, leading up in the 4th century to such formulations as the Nicene Creed, still recited in churches today, where Jesus is affirmed as being fully divine and fully human at one at the same time. Is it possible that this is a later formulation, one that had its roots after Jesus' life, uh, one whose early development can already be seen in the Gospels? If so... Is it possible that Jesus' own actual life was completely different? These will be some of the questions we'll try to resolve in our upcoming lectures. For now, let me conclude by saying that I'm not presenting these as rhetorical questions uh, whose answers are meant to be yes. I'm asking these as genuine questions that anyone concerned with studying the historical Jesus needs to take seriously and to consider reflectively in light of our surviving evidence. The overarching issue will be whether the portrayals of Jesus as a kind of divine human are later developments or whether they go back to Jesus himself. A natural place to begin our reflections is obviously with the primary sources we have about Jesus' life, the Gospels of the New Testament. 
In our next lecture, we'll begin to consider these Gospels to see what kind of books they are and to begin to determine whether they are consistent with one another and reliable documents for knowing what Jesus himself actually said and did.